Chris finally dug you out and got you onto Real Vision. And look, it's really good to get you here. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm really excited. I'm really excited. We've, we've had a number of uh, interesting chats over the years, so it's great, to, it's great to be here. So tell people a little bit about yourself, because you've got a really interesting background and then really interested what you're up to now. So, so what do you do? How do you even describe yourself now? Apart from obviously a guitar player, that's a giveaway. <laughs> a bad, a bad, uh, a bad guitar player. I don't know. I suppose sort of a, a technologist, maybe sort of very, very excited by technology, digitization. Um, you know, the way the world's going, trying to sort of see the future, focused on this idea of of a singularity and uh, and the path towards that. Thinking thinking about how. How we might get there. I, I suppose that that came about. I was actually originally an engineer. Um, at, uh, I did engineering at Cambridge and did a number of industrial placements. Got kind of bored of them, um, just because of the nature of the work. It, it can be a bit slow. So uh, thought I'd go into consulting, but then that was around the time of the tech bubble crash. And before I'd even started a job that I took, the job was no longer there. So I thought, screw this. Um, yeah, I need to go into finance, be ahead of the game. So I ended up working at Merrill Lynch as a as an uh, interest rates market maker and foreign exchange forwards market maker. And that was that was fine, but again, got a bit bored of that. Um, so started just trading markets and um, trying to guess where markets were going, trying to think about future worlds, you know, the next week, the next month, the next six months. And luckily found I was pretty good at it. Um, and then went from there to Goldman Sachs on their GMP desk, their, their flagship sort of global macro prop desk, as it was called. And that was, I mean, that was just... Oh, that was so brilliant. What, what I mean, were you doing there? Because you know that's all gone now. So yeah, what, what was yeah. that like? What were you doing there? So you come as a rates trader from Merrill, and you go to this ridiculous kind of global macro yeah. shop. Talk, talk us through that a bit. Well, it was amazing. I mean, the characters on that desk. I mean, you got to bear in mind, you know, this this is sort of Goldman Sachs and the noughties, and people were coming into the office in their suits, and, you know, all very professional. You know, we're, we're rocking up in you know shorts and trainers and t-shirts, and Jim O'Neill sort of stopping by the desk to say hello, and you know, throwing around crazy amounts of risk, and you know, it was just fabulous because we were we were right in the middle of all of the big sort of macro events, whether it was Iceland going skewy or the financial crisis or Brazil, Brazilian rates blowing up. It was just right in the middle of it, and and you know the characters that that um, that I worked with were phenomenal, and 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 for me it was just a a sharp learning curve into portfolio management um, from from frankly some of the best traders uh, you know out there, and and still still to this day. So what did you what did you learn there about portfolio management? Just um, the style um, you established for yourself, I guess, because everyone's different. Yeah, yeah, I think just. Um, how to build how to build sort of diversified portfolios how to think sort of from a, a top down perspective um, uh, and and you know how to how to smell a move when it's coming how to investigate a trade you know i you know did a trip to iceland once for example to really really get get under the um, under the bonnet of of what's going on and really understand it um, but uh, yeah, it was a it was a it was a great experience, a great experience. And then obviously the finan- the financial crisis came, the whole world went crazy, and that was you know um, wild to say the least. And then shortly after that, um, the Volcker rule. And I thought when the Volcker rule first came out, I'm like, Christ, I'm I'm out of a job. What am I going to do? They can't employ me anymore. And then of course I realised, well, you know, they've got to make me redundant with all my deferred compensation. Um, and I can go and, and and do whatever I want. So I I, uh, I ended up going to work at Tudor. That most of the guys went to Brevin Howard. Um, I went to work for Paul Jones. I wanted to do something on my own. Felt like I was ready. Um, and that was again, you know, I, I mean, just a a, a phenomenal time. Um, I mean, Paul Jones, I, I have a good good relationship with to this day. He's such a nice guy, isn't he? He was a He's mentor amazing. of mine. Yeah, and he's so self-aware. For somebody so successful, he's so incredibly self-aware. I think that's one of the most impressive things about him. Um, but uh, but but obviously, Paul's true gift is 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 really he just drove into me process, 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 and risk management. Um, and I, I was always a, a very a, a, you know a, a, let's call it excitable risk taker. Um, <laughs> Um, that would probably make Paul laugh right now. I probably kept him up at night, but um, yeah, no, and uh, that was great. You know, Tudor, Tudor was some phenomenal years, um, and, and again, lots of exciting times. But my my whole vision 
uh, thesis for for decades, really. And, and it probably started with Chris, the engineer, right back at university, but it's always been around digitization, um, you know, technology, singularity, uh, the impact that, the disinflationary impact that has. And then Donald Trump won the election. And obviously, suddenly, this is going to be phenomenal for macro. Um, and I couldn't get excited about it. I thought, I can't get excited about meetings about the Fed dots. I need to get closer to the technology. So I actually resigned the day Trump won the election um, for, for, for that reason, really, to start investing you know, my family office money, my money in in digital digital technologies basically so what did you see what was good Let, let's go back a little bit um to the the kind of cryptocurrency bitcoin journey when did that come into your life why i would view this i think you have to kind of zoom out like a long way to contextualize what's going on from a macro point of view and a technology point of view so I know you and I both share a, a passion for messing around with our diets, you know, ketogenic diets, paleo diets, et cetera. Um, now, one of the reasons I'm very intrigued by that sort of, you know, dietary process is I think it's fascinating when you start to look at the long history of mankind, certainly the long, long history of the planet, you know, and hominins, as in bipedal, um, you know, uh, apes, have been wandering the planet from 2.6 million years ago, right? Homo erectus was first found around 1.82 million years ago. Homo sapien arrived between two and 300,000 years ago, along with Homo neanderthalis. Then about 60,000 years ago, all these guys just died off and, uh, and it just became sort of Homo sapien roaming three, free. And all of this, all of this history of evolution of, 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 of man, it was, it was going on... Um, it was like a, a hunter-gatherer sort of approach, right? It was it, it was running around looking for foods, and 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 that was your life. Food was the food was the scarce resource. Then there's this other fascinating aspect, which is Milankovitch cycles, which is like the sort of tilt of the of the planet and the elliptical orbit of Earth around the sun, which creates uh, cyclical effects of um, uh, glacial periods, so interglacial periods and glacial periods. And interglacial periods last about 20,000 years and, and glacial periods last between 80 and 100,000 years. So throughout this long history of man, we've cycled in and out of these ice ages. And we came out of the most recent one about 14,000 years ago. Um, and this is now called the Holocene. This is the current inter interglacial. So we're 14,000 years into a probable 20,000 year interglacial. Um, and you start contextualizing that and then you see, oh, OK, so when did the agricultural revolution start? Well, interestingly, when we came out of that, that ice age and people started growing in fields. So that that whole hunter gatherer era, which is millions of years, suddenly became this. Well, not that suddenly, but became this agricultural era. And it was that agricultural era where the civilization started being built so people could be in fields growing food. They didn't have to be out spending their entire time hunting for it. So suddenly the scarce resource of food became actually kind of a scarce resource of arable land, flat arable land near water um, in order to, so suddenly you had this epochal change. You went from hunter gatherer world to agricultural world with a you know scarce resource of food to a scarce resource of land. And then obviously much more recently, we've had this era of, of the industrial age where the you know, civilization and, and sort of enlightenment led to scientific process and this more sort of industrial age, which is, which is where I think most of our investment understanding and our economics understanding comes from. In fact, it's where all of it really comes from. And this whole idea of this time it's different or this time it isn't different and pumping in too much money or taking too much money out. Um, and um, the industrial age is sort of characterized by perhaps the scarcity is more capital and capital stock rather than necessarily land. Hence the business um, cycle. Essentially. Hence, hence the business cycle and such like.